Thanks for joining us on Shannon's Club TV, the show for all motoring fans to share memorable stories from Australian roads and racetracks. In each episode, we profile our feature car with new insights, rare images, and an up-close look at an owner's example. We'll also get a market update from the Shannon's auctions team. Right now though, let's reflect on the 1950s French sedan that brought a touch of Gordini brilliance to everyday motoring, the Renault Dauphine. The progress of Europe from post-war austerity to better times is probably nowhere better incarnated than the 1955 Citroen DS. But the transition from the frumpy little 4CV to the elegant Dauphine also reflects the emergence of France into relative prosperity. While the rear engine 4CV sold in some markets, including Australia, as the 750 had its minimalist charm, the Dauphine was nothing less than a compact beauty. Despite using essentially 4CV mechanicals, including a three-speed gearbox, the Dauphine was engineered to deliver much better handling and a significant increase in performance. Its 845cc engine made 30 brake horsepower and this chic Renault could hit 70 miles per hour. But in 1957, Renault launched the wonderful hot four-speed Gordini version. Mark, I guess when the Gordini arrived here a couple of years later, mm. it surprised some people. I, I mean, in 1960, <laughs> Aussies didn't expect rapid small cars, did they? No, I mean, when you think of uh, the mostly British small cars that were sold here in the late 1940s and 50s, they weren't renowned for their sparkling performance. They certainly were. But I think it's really started to change in 1959 with the launch of the BMC Mini. I think people's expectations yes. of small car performance, particularly under 1,000 cc's, really started to change. So, you know, the Dauphin's arrival here at around the same time was pretty timely, I would have thought. Yes, yeah. indeed. The Gordini was the absolute wolf in sheep's clothing, with 40 brake horsepower, like a 1961 Beetle, but in a much lighter car. Zero to 60 miles per hour took just 20 seconds, and the maximum speed was 80. Like the Volkswagen, the Dauphine was exported to the US in droves, but unlike the German car, its reputation would be lastingly damaged for American consumers by the end of 1960. The Renault simply failed to stand up to 15,000 plus miles per year, and it had not been designed to cruise all day at 65 or 70 miles per hour, which is what typical American customers, growing accustomed to V8 engines, expected. The Dauphine fared better here. In January 1959, it cost 938 pounds, four quid more than the minor. The lion of the automotive jungle was the FC Holden Special at £1,173. In summary, the Dauphine is best thought of as a 4CV with a pretty body and uprated dynamics. Its spirit lived on in the Renault R8, winner of the inaugural Wheels Car of the Year award. As for the Dauphine Gordini, wouldn't you just love to have one of those in your collection? Mark, I imagine that even in October 1961, many drivers in the Armstrong 500 were astonished by the Gordini's turn of speed. Yeah, they sure were. Did an amazing job in the great race, not only once, but twice. The rear engine, rear wheel drive Renault Dauphine became the French Mark's first model to offer a hot Gordini variant that proved to be a potent competition car in numerous countries, including Australia. Amade Gordini, the Italian-born but Paris-based tuning whiz, was a revered name in France, just like Shelby in the USA or Brock in Australia. When Renault contracted him to apply his magical tuning talents to its little Dauphine in 1957, the results were remarkable. His engine, gearbox and suspension enhancements resulted in a car which could be comfortably driven to work each day, yet was also a formidable competitor, scoring major rally victories from Europe to Africa. The fastest Gordini tweaked Dauphine was the 1093, a genuine factory-built racer intended more for competition than street use. Although this stove-hot, limited-build model was not sold in Australia, it also proved popular and successful in a variety of motorsport disciplines. From then on, of course, the Gordini name became synonymous with other high-performance Renaults. 
John, on reflection, you know, that rear engine Gordini era at Renault, that was, that was unique and very special, wasn't it, at that time? Well, it was. I mean, mm. it just occurred to me that in a kind of a way mm. uh, that the Gordini factor at Renault was a little bit like the way Porsche took the Volkswagen as a starting point and made yeah. a sports car out of it. Yeah. You know, the mm. idea of a high-performance rear-engine little car, mm. they, Renault pretty much perfected that, didn't they? Yeah. And those cars, I mean, the, you know, particularly the Dauphine and the R8, very successful competition cars, but when they went to front-wheel drive with the R12, even though Gordini was still tweaking those cars, they weren't nearly as successful. That was a real sweet spot, the rear engine, rear wheel drive. It was, yeah. yes, and it's, it's an era that deserves to be remembered. Yeah, fantastic cars, yeah. yeah. With local assembly taking place in Melbourne, the Dauphine was also eligible for the first running of what was billed as the longest and richest race in the world for showroom stock series production cars, the 1960 Armstrong 500 at Phillip Island. In that first race, Three standard Dauphines, which included Leo Gagan and Ian Gagan on the driving roster, faced five sporty Simca Arons and other marks in the fight for Class B. But the Renaults were outgunned. Simcas claimed a clean sweep of the podium and the highest placed Dauphine finished 10 laps behind. Clearly, more speed was needed. And with the arrival of the hot Gordini version for 1961, the Dauphine duly delivered with an emphatic 1-2 finish in Class D thanks to a quality driver lineup, including Stormen Norm Beachy. Although only one Gordini was entered the following year, the cheeky Renault won again, this time with a winning margin of four laps. The Gordini's success at Phillip Island cemented its enviable status as a multiple great race winner and was yet another demonstration of Gordini's genius. Other great episodes of Shannon's Club TV are available to view anytime on the club website. My name's Keith Pigden, and this is a 1962 Renault Dauphine Gordini, the sports model of the very popular standard Dauphine. I purchased this car from the estate of the original owner about 18 years ago. I still have the original brochure that the woman who bought the car new obtained. You can see here where she's underlined certain features of the specifications. I also have the original purchase receipt from 1962. It had been garaged for a long time and hadn't been driven. It wasn't too bad, but I did a basic mechanical overhaul on it, replaced the clutch, and then a well-known car restorer in the district who was a cousin of mine painted the vehicle for me. The Gordini has a few interior trim treatments above the standard car with a four-speed gearbox. It's 845cc pushrod engine, rear-mounted. It's no power machine, but it's a fairly light car, so the 845cc does push it along OK. It's very 60s in its handling. It's got no synchro mesh on first gear. Keeps up well with modern traffic. It's got a good braking system. It's got independent suspension, so it handles very well. On one occasion a couple of years ago, a girl came up to me and said, I really would like to use that as my wedding car. And I agreed to that. When the wedding service was over, the bridegroom came out and it's the first time I'd met him and he was about six foot seven tall. So you can imagine the fun we had getting he and his new bride into the back of this car to drive them to the reception. Quite an hilarious moment. I've been with Shannon's for about eight years and I have to say that I've had a very good experience. They were very easy to deal with. I've got three adult sons who are all mad car enthusiasts, so I guess when I'm past driving it, I'll give it to one of them. Well, Shannon's National Auctions Manager, Chris Borobon, has dropped by to bring us up to speed on the Renault Dauphine. Welcome back. Okay, well, Welcome, John. Christophe. The Renault Dauphine, that must have been one of the most stylish little cars mm. you could get anywhere in the world in the late 1950s. Would you agree with that? 
Very pretty look, I think. Yeah. You know, Re yeah. Renault, Renault sort of, you know, put their own spin on it. And yeah. I, I think it came out pretty well, you know, rear engine car. Quite small engine, I think, uh, overall, to start, yeah. you know, but it's, it, it had a, that cute factor, I think, about it. Well, you sort of overlap with cars like the Austin A35 mm -hmm. and the Ford mm -hmm. Prefect, you know. So I yep. think in that yep. context, it was really quite exotic. And mm -hmm. these days, of course, we think of the Volkswagen as a pretty stylish piece of kit, but perhaps at the time we didn't. But I think the, the Dauphine really did stand out in the market. Yeah, I think it did. It was slightly different to those yeah. cars, and, and it was probably prettier than half those cars, yes. I think. So it was, I think, interesting in itself. And French, obviously, had its mm. own little intricacies, yeah. Yes. yeah. Interesting time in Renault history, wasn't it? Cause yeah. We had the, the 4CV, or the 750, as it was sold here. Then along came the Dauphine, and then the, the, the R8. An era of rear-engine Renaults. So yes. where does the Dauphine fit in terms of desirability amongst those cars? Good question. Yeah, yeah, good question, that one. I mean, we, we've actually seen a couple come through the auction house in uh, recent years. Mm. Um, I mean, they've got desirability factor about them. Um, Especially it's a, it's the Gordini. Big, well, the Gordini, if you can find one. We haven't yeah. come across oh, any yeah. Gordinis in How recent times. How rare would that be? That's yeah. quite a rare find today. Yeah. Uh, but the ones we've, we've found have been, you know, it's a good entry-level point for someone oh, yeah. uh, who's into French classics. Yes. Um, obviously economical given the size of the engine. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, look, not a bad, you know, starter, I think, classic. Um, and, and doesn't take much room in a garage either. Mm. And the one, most of the ones in Australia were assembled by Continental in general in Melbourne. Yeah, that's right. Um, are they the most common exhibits that you find around the place, or are there people bringing no, them in from overseas? Well, well, I think given the price point, it's not something that you know we, we see come into the country. Yeah. Uh, I think really most of them that we have here are the locally assembled cars. Yeah, there wouldn't be a lot of survivors. No, no there wouldn't. For all oh, that wow. prettiness, there's a fragility about the car mm. mechanically too, and I mean, mm. really quite primitive in some ways, a three-speed gearbox. Mm. with that tiny little yeah. engine. Yes. But you, you say that, but then at the time, you know, the car was enormously successful in rallying you know, yep. across the world. Yeah. And of course, it won, won uh, twice at Phillip Island when that track was breaking up really badly. So yes, yeah, yeah. it seemed to hang in there in, in competition form. It certainly seemed to be a pretty rugged thing, but then it had some reliability issues outside. So yeah, a bit of a mix. Yeah, yeah, that, well, that's what they've been renowned for over the years. Absolutely right. That, that Gordini was an exceptional car for the mm. year, wasn't it? Because we it didn't really think about Little hot little cars in those days. It no, was quite no. unusual. Yep. Yeah. So what if you wanted to, 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 if you found one or you want to restore one, um, where do you get parts for these cars now? That'd be pretty difficult, wouldn't it? Or, or, although I must admit, we have a very strong French car scene in Australia. Is, is there we a do. There, there's, a, there's really, a, I mean, there, there's really a strong, um, as you mentioned, you know, the, I think the French car clubs have got a you know, strong network here. Mm. Um, would you go and do a full restoration on one? Probably not. Right. Um, that's I what, the, the, the resale value? The resale is, value is not there. Right. I think you'd find a car that's been maintained mm -hmm. um, and, and probably improve on that car mm -hmm. if you needed to. Uh, but I think, you know, probably the first point of call is head to the, the car clubs and, and uh, try and find one for the clubs because I think that's okay. probably where you'll find most of them today. Well, thanks, Chris. No problem, guys. Remember, you can give up to date with all the latest Shannon's auctions news on the Shannon's Club website. For your own competition image of the Renault Dauphine, visit Autopic's incredible motorsport photo archive. John, it's interesting looking at this car. The Dauphine, you know, rear engine, rear wheel drive, a number of European manufacturers adopted that. They saw that as the future in small car packaging. Um, but you'd have to say the VW Beetle just dwarfed all of them, didn't it? Well, the VW Beetle was the only one that made a, an enduring success of it. Mm. And it was probably the only one that was really ideally suited to this continent. Mm. A, because of its overdriven fourth gear, and B, because of its very rugged, robust suspension with 15-inch wheels, and mm. handled rough roads really, really very well. The Dauphine, its, its fragility was not exposed here in the way it was in the American market, because mm. Australians didn't expect even their first car to cruise at 70 miles an hour. That, those speeds were quite unusual. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the Renault Dauphine wasn't tested in that way mm. in Australia that it was in the US. Mm. So I never heard of it being found wanting. Mm. But obviously the, the Volkswagen Beetle overshadowed every other small rear drive car, it's rear engine car. Yeah, when you look back on that rear engined era, it just stands above all and the others. And you've got the Hillman Imp and <laughs> BMW 700s. NSU and Prince, and Prince, all the other Prince. attempts. Yes, yeah. 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 yeah, but the VW was king, wasn't it? It certainly mm. was. Interesting. Yeah. We hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the Renault Dauphine. We hope you can join us next time for Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.